<laughs> well, thank you for the introduction. And yeah, the, the point about my military service, uh, and I'll leave this up uh, for a few more seconds before I get on to the next one, uh, is important that the that folks know that this is the angle, this is the lens, rather, in which I look at Longstreet through, uh, rather than simply uh, a, a typical biographer or a typical academic historian. <clears throat> you know, most of the things about him that have been written uh, the mainstream historiography have been fairly negative after the war. And these are some, here's an example of that, that center paragraph, upper center of the slide here, this newspaper article, this writer calling General Longstreet an appalling moral fall for whatever the purposes that he, that he was saying here. And, uh, and this is, I think, what most of the books, uh, how they painted him in the latter part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Um, you know, the, uh, he, he got into the public eye right away uh, after the war in 1866. He helped Mr. Swinton write his book about the uh, Army of the Potomac, and that's the first source which came from Longstreet's input that Lee promised to fight a defensive campaign, which would become a controversial thing later on. Uh, 1866, he started a business uh, in, in Louisiana. Uh, the next year, he and Lee received pardons. And that's when he starts writing letters in the New Orleans Times, where he is saying he essentially supports the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. So this doesn't go very well with some of his, a few of his contemporaries, like Jubal Early down there and, and the picture uh, and, you know, 1868, he joins the Republican Party and, and and he does more things that rub these people wrong. You know, and he issues this particular General Order 39 when he was in Louisiana uh, in those years uh, as a uh, in charge of militia. He says this here, you know, you'll accept the civil and political equality of all men, agree not to attempt to deprive any person of color, race or previous condition of any civil rights. So that's a kind of a forward thinking thing as well uh, politically or uh, or civilly uh that that seemed to get him in trouble with a few of these people and that snowballed into the 20th century you know Douglas Southall Freeman and other writers continued to uh, uh to to somewhat denigrate him uh and and cast him out of the legacy that were like that you saw Lee and, and Jackson uh appear in very positively going forward. So, um, you know, you have to understand that about General Longstreet. But for me, as a military man, uh, once I, I mean, I read all of this as well, and I got I got the message on this. But when I became a military man uh, and and understood tactics and operations and fire support and and so on and so forth, and we start to look at things done in the past, and I looked at some of his work, and I got to the I, I, I realized that no, he was. He was on to doing things that are correct in my time period that became the method of war in my time period. So that was that was the genesis of, of where I'm coming at uh, General Longstreet on. So uh, with that, um, today I'm going to talk to you primarily about a portion of the book. I'll get to a modern defense, which is a tactical uh, level piece of work, uh, a, a very modern offense, another tactical piece of work. But in between, I'll also uh, touch on his uh, strategic estimate uh, in 1863 in the context of uh, Gettysburg and the Vicksburg situations, you know, and a couple of other things. I can't cover the entire book, of course, in an hour, but uh, I'm going to hit on some of the major pillars here and uh, and uh, as, as, a, uh, as an intro to the book there. So uh, Army officers coming out of the out of their, say, their academies in the decades before the Civil War, were generally taught that the tactical offense was dominant in warfare. And that was because of the, the, the system, weapon systems of the time. But as you can see, you know, like in this painting here, the units had to get fairly close to each other before they could open fire on each other and use their firepower against each other. And that was because of the, the technology of the time. And this year is the uh, the British brown bass. Many millions of these were made that could be loaded and fired probably three times per minute. Maybe a good marksman could could load and fire four times per minute. 
But uh, this one here could strike a figure of a man at about 80 yards out. And uh, according in, like in this quote here, it might even hit a man at 100, but a soldier must be unfortunate indeed who'll be wounded at 150. So the, you know, the tactics are built around this. The British Army, for example, might stand out, had practiced to stand maybe 80 yards out. They would take a volley from their opponent. Uh, they might t take some casualties, but being at maximum effective range, it shouldn't be too many. And then they would move forward, you know, like perfect automatons with that two foot long gleaming bayonet. that they might stop about 40 yards out and then open fire on their enemy who's still loading. And they should inflict more casualties. And then maybe they would close with the bayonet to finish the job. So it, because of this technology, as I say there on the bottom, close order formations were necessary to you know concentrate firepower and in, in compensate for the uh, inherent in, inaccuracies in the uh, in the weapons and that is why the tactical the direct approach tactical offense was generally viewed as as dominant all things being equal as far as the terrain is concerned but there were situations even in the 18th century where the tactical defense could thwart the tactical offense. And here are two examples here. And uh, well, sorry to sorry to show two where the British lose. Or, well, they win one costly and the other one where they lose. But, uh, uh, you know, Bunker Hill, for example, 1775 is one of these examples where the tactical defense was superior to their direct approach, costing them a tremendous amount of casualties. 800 men killed trying to take the colonists' works there. Uh, Bunker Hill. They, and the reason the colonists gave up in the end was they they simply ran out of ammunition. If they had more ammunition and probably would have been even more painful. And then this example here on the right, 1815 in New Orleans, another very lopsided result. Very few casualties are for the defender who's using works, some kind, walls and, and trench line and such. Uh, and the British were out there right in the open, perfect targets. So you know, this is, I think that uh, Longstreet learns a painful example about this in the uh, in the Mexican War that he participates in. At this particular battle at Molino El Rey, there is a structure in this walled town called Casamata, which his unit was to assault out in the open in the direct approach. And uh, uh, their opponent was uh, who was in charge was a, a very effective officer, this Brigadier General Perez. He was confident and he had made good preparations and they repulsed the Americans. And Longstreet, Lieutenant Longstreet at the time was wounded in this action. He was hit in the leg. And so I think he takes away from this example a reality that what he had learned in the school and what the typical understanding was or the, the narratives were that everybody pronounced uh, in this time period about the tactical offense being superior was not the whole story. And it wasn't always true that the tactical defense could be much more powerful uh, in this way, you know, when fighting this way. And that, 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 uh, and, and I think he brings us forward uh, going into the, uh, into the American civil war, the war between states, whichever you want to call it. Now, um, as I said, I don't have time to go into uh, first Manassas and, and the entire first year of the war the in the Peninsula campaign. In, in my book, one of the themes, though, <clears throat> coming out of being a military person that I talk about in this period of time is that they had a tremendous, everybody coming into the military had a tremendous learning curve, whether you were the soldiers or the NCOs or the officers, company officers, the or the or the general officers. You know, some of them had been civilians and all of a sudden they're wearing a uniform and they really don't know what they're doing. So everybody is learning their jobs, uh, trying to figure out what they're doing. And one of the things that they're doing at the general officer level is trying to figure out the right force structure, organizational structure to make all this work. So, you know, Manassas, uh, the first Manassas, the Battle of Wilson's Creek out in uh, Missouri, you know, these were battles where the leaders struggled just to put together and hold together their their regiments and barely were able to put, you know, fight brigades as cohesive units and not at all could they do divisions very well. This improved in the Peninsula campaign in the East uh, through the first year. And it wasn't until the very last, you know, Gaines Mill, one of nearly the last battle of the uh, 
one of the last battles of the Peninsula Campaign, that, that they were able to put together cohesive at least two division assaults, and Longstreet was in charge of those primarily. Um, so after that, then, you know, Johnston is wounded during the Peninsula Campaign. Robert E. Lee takes over there in the east for the Confederates, and he settles into uh, a two-wing structure. He's, he's Longstreet's one wing, and Jackson's going to be the other. And after the Peninsula Campaign, they move up to Northern Virginia to deal with General Pope, who's assembled another army up there, and they got to go after that before uh, McClellan's army comes up from the peninsula <clears throat> and joins and then overmatches them massively. So, you know, they fall on Pope uh, at Second Manassas. Jackson gets there first and, and turns his line uh, and pushes him back. Uh, and then Pope uh, finds him at the railroad cut there at uh, near the old battle, near the first year's battlefield. So Lee and Longstreet show up uh, the next day after Jackson had first been attacked and uh, Longstreet you know, deploys now five divisions uh, in in the wing that he's controlling. And when the time is right and the Union, all the Union uh, reserves are committed to attacking Jackson, he drops the hammer and, and sweeps them uh, on this particular day. So I find this particular battle of victory, of improvement, really of organizational structure, of command and control, uh, the pinnacle at this point in the war and in the, you know any military history in North America, I don't think anyone up to this point in North America had ever put together a cohesive five division attack like this one uh, up to this point. So, <clears throat> so uh, that's the that's the the kind of thing that he starts to bring to the table for the Confederates, whether it's the tactics or the operationals or the organizational structure and, and so on, as, they, uh, as they're as they moving forward and learning how to do things better constantly, thinking outside of the box. So after Second Manassas, Lee wants to hurry up and, and get up into, uh, into Maryland. And he thinks that, uh, and you know, not just him, but the administration and, and other thinkers have thought that uh, now would be a good chance, uh, since the Union is in a bit of disarray uh, on here on the East Coast, that uh, we should get up into into the Loudoun region in in uh, Maryland. If we have a large presence of an army, maybe the uh, secessionists in Maryland will try for another conference and see if they can bring vote to bring the state out of the union. That was one of the one of the objectives. Another one was militarily uh, uh, was military and it was the logistics. They needed food, so they thought they could uh, forage better up there than where they were. And the last one was also political, uh, and this had to do primarily with England, really, and other and the other European nations. But Lord Palmerston, they believed, was on the fence at the time, the Prime Minister of England, that uh, he might uh, throw in with uh, declaring, you know, his support for the Confederacy, that he might recognize the independence of the Confederate states, and he was sitting looking for a possible good result, a, a battlefield result by the by the uh, Confederate army in the East. So Lee thought that if if they could do something like that, then maybe they, they would swing England uh, more in their corner, uh, you know, if, if that was possible. So those were the three motivations <clears throat> for going up in, into Maryland uh, after Second Manassas. Now, uh, you know, then there was the problem though that uh, they had lost this order 191 and that uh, and McClellan came back into the picture and that got him energized to move toward Lee's army and so that sort of arrested Lee's uh, Lee's activities in the state they fought a uh, a battle at South Mountain and then Lee's army came down into this location around Sharpsburg or and Tatum Creek there where they would fight so <clears throat> this is the larger picture map the the battle starts on the left wing there in the upper left-hand corner against Jackson, and they fight in the cornfield. And then the afternoon phase more is the right wing, which is uh, there in the center, which is going to be Longstreet's uh, that he's going to Longstreet's wing that he's going to take charge of. So I'll give you the, the close up there. And think about this. This is the lead up about this is I'm using this as the lead up to ex explaining his modern approach to the tactical defense here. And uh, what he finds here at this particular position is this sunken road. You've all heard of the sunken road. There's the picture drawing of it there in the bottom right. 
And this drawing, you know, where the where the artist is, he's probably standing there at the elbow, uh, the bend in the sunken road there on the map on the left. And the thing about this is that the soldiers who are going to take their positions in the sunken road, uh, general, primarily General Anderson's division, are going to be standing lower than their opponents who are going to come at them perpendicularly on that open plain, those open pastures. Uh, they're going to be probably they're going to be protected to some degree. They're only going to only the top half of their body is going to be exposed. And since they're lower, their volleys are going to be lower, which means they're going to have a larger probability of hitting somebody. And this time in the war, the volleys often flew over the heads of, of each other. So that's going to improve their rifle marksmanship. I like and so there and here's an artist's drawing of uh, of how it must have looked there uh, from one angle of these guys being lower uh, than their opponent. But the point here is that when the Union uh, attacks came at them in a direct approach, at this point the the snapshot that I'm showing you here, nine thousand strong come at twenty two hundred defending the sunken road. These twenty two hundred were able to repulse them several times. Then they had to. The Union had to uh, reform and try again. And it wasn't until they figured that the Union figured we need to get on their flank and enfilade this. And they moved troops uh, to the side where that number 2200 is on the map uh, in red. And then they were able to enfilade and kill some more of the Confederate soldiers in the sunken road and essentially a trench and then finally overcome it. When they were able to finally pull the push the Confederates out, and backwards, uh, Longstreet came in uh, to apply some of his, you know, battlefield leadership and bring reinforcements in. And he and his uh, staff came on this Miller's battery, and all of the soldiers were the cannon crewmen were wounded. And he puts his staff in charge, you know, and puts his staff in to crew the guns, and and they fire a canister into the advancing Federals and and stop them at that point. And then he's able to organize a counterstroke, and then they start to push them back some. They don't retake the sunken road, but by the end of the day's fighting there, they uh, they maintain their the integrity of their primary position. Um, and so that becomes the result of, of Antietam. The Confederates, um, you know, manage, and I would say, in the tactical sense to uh, be successful at Antietam because they don't give their position away. They don't lose their position. They're not, their line's not ruptured. Their flanks are not not turned. So, uh, but in the, in the strategic level, I think uh, this battle is a win for the Federals because none of those, those two, well, those two political objectives never happened. Uh, didn't do anything for uh, swinging England their way. It didn't, uh, it didn't get any secessionists to try for another uh, secession convention. And so uh, then Lee would, uh, then Lee would retire into Virginia and, and continue continue on for the next uh, operation. But for Longstreet, what he takes away from this is the power of that particular kill zone that they had, the, the ability for 2,200 men to, come to, 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 strong, to, to hold off 9,000 with almost ease uh, when they came at them directly. So when, uh, when President Lincoln decides he's going to put uh, General Burnside in charge and give the next general a chance, uh, he's Longstreet and Lee are out at Culpeper, Virginia, and uh, they figure that uh, well now Burnside's going to be pressed to try another attack uh, somewhere and get at and get through them and then move on to Virginia. And they figure it's going to be here at Fredericksburg. It's going to cross cross the Rappahannock River there, come through the town, and then cut the distance uh, you know shorter than what McClellan had tried on the Peninsula Campaign and move toward Richmond. So Lee uh, instructs Longstreet to get out to Fredericksburg and set up blocking positions there. He would go out west and get Stonewall Jackson and then bring him in as fast as he could. So Longstreet gets out here uh, just with his wing at the time, surveys the area, and he sees this nice open plain there between the town and the base of Marie's Heights, which is this top picture. You can see nice and flat. This was a, a, a fairgrounds used uh, by the townspeople for their, you know, farm, farm, you know, selling goods and whatnot. Uh, it was perfect. It was flat. And there was no way to uh, maneuver to the right or the left because of difficult terrain and, uh, and canals and, and mud flats and things like that. So 
he he starts to envision this is this is the spot that I want to use to really hurt the uh, Union Army. And there's a sunken road here as well that he finds, which is even better than the one at Antietam. This one here has a nice wooden has a nice stone wall. Uh, and uh, if you the, the picture there at the bottom right shows how perfect this thing is for this situation. It's four feet high. And this particular section, the stones are pretty thick, two feet thick. And so a man can lean up against it, rest his elbows on that nice platform and uh, use and, be, you know, create a supported what we call the military supported prone firing position. You know, these are positions where you use anything, sandbags, rocks, logs, et cetera, to rest on. And they maximize the stability of the frame of one's body. And they also, therefore, improve the stability of the weapon. So really, it reduces the shaking. You know, if you stand up and just hold a weapon and point a weapon standing up, you know, you're shaking. Even if you don't realize it. It happens, but this cuts down on that a lot, and that creates uh, greater accuracy. So from this position, he's going to be able to uh, do an even better job inflicting casualties with his troops that are right there up on the wall than they did at uh, Antietam is what he envisioned. So part of this plan is a kind of a ruse. He doesn't put a lot of forces in the town itself opposite the uh you know, opposite the Union on the other side of the Rappahannock. He wants to encourage them to come across. I mean, he's going to have some. He puts some sharpshooters in the town. You can, they take shots at the Union. You can see the this artist's depiction of the Union trying to bridge the river there and splashes in the water from Confederates taking shots at him. But I think they were definitely instructed uh, not to make it impossible for them so they could get across, to let them come through the town, clear the Confederates from the town, and let them... Uh, bring their entire force on the other side, reassemble their order of battle, and then so that they would come at them and think that they were doing, you know, a good job getting to where getting to the point where they are, and and it works. Now, uh, the first part of the battle was again another morning phase. It's off this map, which was uh, against Long. Or, I mean, uh, Jackson's wing. When when Lee brought in Jackson, he emplaced him on the right. And so Burnside started on, on his side. Now, Jackson only had about a day to prepare. Longstreet had a long time uh, to prepare. So Jackson's guys only had about a day to dig. They did dig a, a, a trench, and it was kind of, it, it gave his men about the as much protection as the sunken road at um, Antietam gave Longstreet's men. So they were about halfway covered, halfway protected. Uh, so it wasn't as perfect as the position here on the left. But uh, uh, Jackson's line was penetrated at one point by Major General Meade, who was a division commander then. And uh, he got in, he, he made some headway, but then Jackson marshaled reserves and pushed him out and stabilized his line. And then the afternoon phase, about one o'clock, Burnside starts in on the strongest point in the Confederate order of battle, which is Longstreet's wing here. At Marie's Heights, and they start and they continue. They continue these rep repetitive assaults uh, from one to three thirty, roughly. Uh, every single one of them is broken up, um, and it's it seems to be you know almost hopeless for them as they come into this kill zone and get and get mowed down each and every time. Now that dotted line there uh, represents uh, the spot where the most of the Union soldiers were were felled by the Confederate, uh, either the artillery or the uh, or the rifle marksmanship. And it said that only a few of them got within even a hundred yards of the wall. So uh, Lee is standing up there on uh, up there with Longstreet watching this and uh, where he makes this uh, fairly famous uh, quote about the uh, the cost that it was to the, to the union that, that a lot of people uh, are fairly familiar with. But so what is it that, from my perspective, from a modern soldier's perspective, what is it that he does here that is modern, that is that is radical for the time period? Well, to me, it's, it's quite clear that he has applied the principles of a pretty perfect, doctrinally cor correct 20th century kill zone uh, that that we teach, uh, you know, that's in our books. Now he doesn't know what's going to be in the future, but 
but uh, you know he thinks out kind of outside of the box and and comes up with a couple of things. So a kill zone in our time, what I was trained right in basic training is that a, a typical kill zone or a perfect one, an ideal one, is going to be somewhat concave in shape. If you have high ground, you're going to use that. But the purpose of the of the concave shape is that you're going to have men on each side and they're going to have interlocking fields of fire in the kill zone. And those interlocking fields of fire are going to make it so that there's no place to hide for the for the for the opponent who's coming into this into this kill box. And so if somebody on the you know in one uh foxhole can't see a blind spot along his lane, somebody farther down the line certainly will. And then there's also a discipline for the soldiers. A soldier who, uh, who is assigned a certain spot, he's going to have a lane, his NCO or his officer is going to tell him, you're going to shoot just in this lane. They might, in my day in basic training, they would put a stick uh, in the ground on, on my right and my left, and they'd say, you just shoot in this lane that's it. You acquire targets and take them down as fast as you can. If you see something off to the right or off to the left, that's not your target. Somebody else is responsible for that down the line. You'll only be told to shoot on something else if the leadership tells you to do that. So this creates a disciplined fire control. And something else he does that happens here, maybe not with all of the units, but some of them is, uh, but you see that in this, this picture here drawn after the war is that they had a line of fires. And these soldiers were, would do the shooting, and they would not do any reloading. There were men behind them who would take the empty rifle and reload it and, and, and then hand it to the firer while he would hand them the empty. And so, as I said on that slide with the British Brown Best, the, the musket of this, time, of this century could usually be fired three, maybe four times a minute. But when you have a man who's just shooting a rifle and not having to go through the loading drill then his rate of fire goes up to 8, 9, 10, 11 rounds per minute, every firer on the line. So in this particular application, Longstreet increases the rate of fire. It's like he is achieving the uh, the effect of the machine gun into this kill zone at this particular place with a, you know, with a lot of men, of course, several brigades there, right there uh, along the sunken road. So that's what he does with the infantry. Then you have uh, the fire support, the artillery. Now, um, this piece here is your typical field artillery piece. It could shoot about one mile. Um, it was essentially a direct fire weapon, of course. Uh, so the, the cannon crewmen could pretty much see what they were shooting at, even at max effective range, about a mile, un until you know a lot of smoke maybe accumulated in the air. But an, a weapon like this would have... Uh, you know, at max range would have a very gradual arc. The, the, the ball uh, mid midpoint might come up about six feet high and then gradually go down, uh, you know, to the ground or, you know, to the middle of a, of a man's figure. And so this weapon is represented by the gray arrow there, uh, most left closest to the target, um, the red target explosion there. So it's, you know, it's, it's straight. I show a straight line there. And that's how it compares to these later modern weapons. Later on, you, you also have some heavier ordnance in the Civil War um, that could shoot about two miles, two, maybe a little more than two miles. That's that second gray arrow. And these weapons were too heavy to put on a wheeled carriage. They would generally be coastal pieces um, because of just how heavy they were and, and uh uh, and, and how much you know powder they would use in the size of the balls, but they could shoot a little bit further. Now, later, after the Civil War in the 1880s, the artillery community, the industry, figured out how to uh, perfect the breech, the back of the gun, that they make a breech that could open up where they could put the round in, then a powder bag, close it, and this new breech was strong enough to withstand the pressures of the expanding gases when the when the powder was ignited and that would throw the round far into the distance to, out to ranges that were beyond the horizon so uh, that created a need for a, a a grid system with precise mathematical and uh, geometrical computational procedures you know with protractors and 
and uh, muzzle velocities and, and charge books and all kinds of things that had to be used for precise calculation of, of predicted accurate fire. That became the future of field artillery and coastal artillery at the time. So like these weapons that I have here off to the right, these are you know modern 20th century weapons that were in my first war, Desert Storm, 105, 155 millimeter, 203 millimeter howitzers. My gun was this 155 millimeter self-propelled gun and has a turret, looks kind of like a tank. And it could shoot out about 15 miles or so max range. And you can see the uh, the graph that, you know, even at low angle fire, the, the round would go over four miles in the air on its trajectory before it comes down. That eight inch gun off to the right, the 203 millimeter, that was came into the inventory in the 1950s and we used it through Desert Storm, then was replaced by MLRS, Multiple Launch Rocket System. I have one up there on the top, which you see, uh, uh, you see on TV a lot now in the Ukraine-Russia war, a lot of that type of artillery is being used to reach out real far. But like this gun here, the eight inch could shoot over 20 miles and its round would fly seven miles in the air at its max trajectory before coming down. So the point of this is that as artillery uh, was able to uh, shoot far out beyond the horizon and you had to bring all these capabilities in to, to calculate you know, how to, how to uh, hit its target precisely at these kinds of ranges, it allowed for your artillery to spread out and it created for different doctrines to be used. Oh, and this is, uh, you know, this is the fire direction center now that would have to be added to do all these things. In the 1890s, 1880s, they would do this mathematically with charts and paper. And then today it's also done, of course, with computers and a hardened laptop like you see here inside of a track. But in the 18th century and in the 19th century, field artillery was direct, generally then, because it was a direct fire weapon, they were shooting at something they could see it was decentralized, as we say. It was direct support to 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 infantry units. So, for example, if this terrain feature that I scribbled on the bottom here is Mary's Heights, and these three batteries are placed where they are, they are just firing in direct support of some, say, infantry unit that that's right with them on the side, and they have a habitual working relationship between that battery commander and that brigade commander in the infantry and they serve as targets for them they generally aren't going to shoot something off to the right or left because that's not helping out their their infantry their infantry commander so that's direct support but with the with the improvements of artillery that i described to you later into the late 19th century and 20th century you also can use it as in a centralized role Reinforcing fire, as we call this. And this is where they uh, the, all the artillery is directed to pile in on targets as directed by a higher level commander, say a corps commander like Longstreet here. So what he does this here at Fredericksburg. At Fredericksburg, Longstreet takes away the artillery from all of the maneuver commanders, the lower level commanders, the brigade commanders. It's not to support them directly. And he puts it under his artillery coordinator here, who is Porter Alexander. And the two of them, before the battle starts, they emplace all the batteries and check out the, you know, their range fan to make sure everything is covered in the kill zone and overlaps with the infantry direct fires. And, and, and use what we call today centralized reinforcing fire scheme instead of the typical thing that happened in the 18th century. And this works pretty great. Uh, the first three Union assaults are broken up exclusively by the artillery. And then, oh, and that dotted line, the, 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 those dotted lines there also depict uh, something that I thought was kind of interesting that, he, that Longstreet does there. While he's preparing, he calls down to Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond to ask if they can send up some of these heavy ordnance pieces. Like I said, they're too heavy. They don't have wheels, but they had to bring them up on wagons and they put them on a hill that becomes Lee's headquarters when Lee shows up. Today, it's called Lee's Hill. And that's about two miles from gun to target. And that's why you know I show those dotted lines off the map. So these guns are firing over the Confederate field artillery, over the Confederate infantry to service targets 
in the kill zone. I thought that was an interesting little example also of what he does there that um, that is quite modern in my view uh, at this particular battle. And so this is a good quote that he says uh, later after the war, he puts in an article in Battles and Leaders. You know, he says, we've had 20 odd days which to prepare for the, for the approaching battle, which harkens back to that point about I was making about why the tactical defense was much superior to the tactical direct approach offense when you know infantry walked out in the open and exposed like they did in a lot of these battles. And this, this is another one of those uh, quotes that shows he was thinking this way, in my, in my opinion. So to recap on the defense, this is what this is what we're taught in, in, in the army that uh, when you're setting a defense, the first thing you're going to do, is you're going to look at the scheme, you're going to visualize how you think the enemy is going to approach, how they're going to deploy in the attack. Then you're going to select where you find the piece of real estate you're going to select, where to set up your kill zone, then position your, you know, your ground, your maneuver forces, who are the direct fire systems, in this case, just the infantry, and then supplement that or add to that with the indirect fires uh, to uh, you know, to pile in on what the uh, direct fire weapon systems are doing. So, so I thought, you know, perfect, perfect modern defense there that he does in 1862 on a massive scale, really. So after uh, December 1862, I think Longstreet has an idea coming out from Fredericksburg and how they can defeat Union armies repetitively uh, using the tactical defense. That's one way, but they don't have a uh, a national military strategy, and the Union does have a national military strategy. They started out with one that was advised by General Winfield Scott right at the beginning of the war. Winfield Scott was aging, and he couldn't be a field commander anymore, but he did advise Lincoln about a, a couple of things that he called the Anaconda Plan, or, or Scott's Great Snake, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the first part of that was a a naval blockade along the eastern seaboard of the Confederate States and also the Gulf of Mexico to either interdict as much as possible or mitigate uh, the, the as much of the supply and the purchase of goods and war materials from Europe and Britain and, and maybe elsewhere uh, to cut down on that. Then the second part was to divide the south along the Mississippi River. And then the last part that he envisioned was that the the larger Union armies should attack the South as simultaneously, in concert, almost simultaneously, so that their numbers advantage would be too overwhelming for the South uh, to manage if it happened at the same time, and they wouldn't be able to flex units in between theaters in time to equalize any of these pressures. So the, uh, the first two parts were going all right, the, the naval blockade was having some effect, and Grant was working his way down the uh, Mississippi. He had been successful in the beginning of the war at Fort Donaldson, and now he was getting close to taking uh, Vicksburg. He was working on Vicksburg uh, in early 1863. So, uh, but it was the third part that wasn't really doing being done very well yet by the Union. Their overall, their land campaigns were not in concert like he had envisioned on a large scale. And this doesn't really happen until 1864 when Grant is put in charge. You know, he he gets it. He he understands Scott's plan when he takes over in 1864 that all armies are to move together toward one common center. And he makes that happen and finishes it. But so Longstreet looks at this coming out of December 1862. How do you counter something like this? What what is our grand what should our grand strategy be? Now I call what he envisions in my book a defensive offense, defensive strategy, but with offensive operational level um, attacks, uh, offensives, if you will. He thinks through what is the defensible, the reasonable defensible perimeter of the Confederate nation. Um, you have the largest Confederate armies depicted here, Lee and Virginia Bragg there, and well, he was in Kentucky, now he's operating in Tennessee, he's about to be pushed down into Georgia, and then you have smaller pieces uh, to the east in the Mississippi River, 
under the control of Johnston, Beauregard on the coast, and Pemberton with uh, about 23,000 in Vicksburg. Uh, everything to the east of the Mississippi River, there just isn't the force structure out there. They're going to do have to do the best they can with with small uh, smaller forces. But but to keep the Confederacy viable, this here depicted on this slide is is what Longstreet envisions. They have to. This is the must hold perimeter of the castle, if you will. And they he thinks that at strategic defense should have uh, operational offensives that use the interior lines of this perimeter and the rail system, which is depicted in green and red, which means two different gauges, which isn't great, but you know he, they can make it work and they do. Uh, and you you deploy troops, whatever, left, right, up and down, and go after a select union target, and you try to build a window of a numerical superiority against that targeted army and try and defeat it. Whether you use the tactical defense or the offense, whatever, uh, you know, try to do whatever makes the most sense to try and come out with a good result. And if you defeat it, then realign again and wait for the next opportunity to inflict another defeat on some union target. And and the last part of this, I think he thinks, is that you want to do this, run out the clock, as it were, on the Union until November of 1864, when Lincoln is going to face his next election. And if, it, if, if they had made it so painful for the Union to prosecute the war and casualties and other costs and national and treasure and whatnot, then maybe Lincoln is not going to get reelected and, and someone else will come in, perhaps a peace Democrat, and suspend the war. And then they would get out from under this thing and, and win their independence. So now at this point, Longstreet is talking Western concentration after Fredericksburg because of what Grant is doing in his work to, to uh, get at Vicksburg. And Lee is initially, uh, and the other choice, of course, is uh, reinforce Bragg in Tennessee. But uh, I think Longstreet is most concerned about the situation in Mississippi. So I think his main thrust here is reinforce Johnston. Uh, but Lee is not enamored with this idea at this stage of the war. He's more parochial to Virginia. So he counters this idea with an invasion of Pennsylvania. Longstreet, I know they have a number of conversations, and I believe Longstreet comes out with this thinking that Lee has agreed that they will then therefore use defensive tactics if they go into Pennsylvania. And he says that, okay, then let me but my core, the first core, receive an assault, and you protect my flanks with the other two corps. He has this comment here in his memoir. You know, my my core is as steady as a rock. It's not to be broken. I'll work and wait for its chosen. We will take the direct assault. I'll work and wait uh, for the chosen battle. So that's, I think, what he he believes Lee is is in agreement with. Um, but um, unfortunately. The problem, in my view, uh, and I, I have four chapters in my book on Gettysburg, and I'm not going to get into too much of the nuts and bolts about the tactics, but most people, most treatments about Gettysburg tend to focus on just the tactical things that happened in the battle. And if this guy did that and this guy was a little more, you know, uh, motivated here and, and so on, or they'd just gone another 100 yards or something, there might have been another outcome or whatever. Well, maybe some of those things are true, but I think the actual truth about Gettysburg is that Lee really had no advantages there tactically, and they all the advantages went to Meade. So in the end, the, the probability of winning went to Meade, and that's why Lee lost. But I see the problem, when you look at it that way, I see the problem in the operational level. The operational level interrelates tactics and strategy. Lee never defined a campaign objective, and I know this because this is my this is my line of work. Uh, he doesn't articulate any place where they're going to go exactly, and without any uh, actions on the objective. This is standard doctrine today in writing campaign orders and mission orders. So what really happens is well, let me just say what what there is in the historical record is best that I can find is that he says we'll come out of Virginia, we'll pass through Maryland, we'll get into Pennsylvania, and we'll turn, we'll come up and we'll turn on this large arc toward the Susquehanna River, and maybe we'll go in the direction of 
Philadelphia or maybe Baltimore. But that's not an objective. That's vague guidance. And that's where the problem lies. So his three primary subordinates, his three core commanders, under in the context of that vague guidance, they don't really know what they're doing up there most of the time because there's no place that they that they have to get to in a hurry and then do something there. So between the 3rd of June and the 21st of June, there are relatively slow movements through Virginia and Maryland. Then Dick Ewell, who's out, uh, out, of, out in front, he reaches Harrisburg, the outskirts of Harrisburg by late June. And then Lee thinks, okay, that'll be the objective. But then the next day he reverses himself based on intel through Longstreet spy, this Mr. Henry Harrison, who sees two Union Corps at Frederick, Maryland. He thinks that the Union are catching up to him. So he orders this concentration at the Cashtown Gettysburg area with the idea that this is going to nudge Meade to the east. Well, it doesn't work. Meade doesn't, nobody, they don't retreat. They stand and fight and then they take to the high ground. And then of course the battle is joined at Gettysburg and, and you know, as I said, they don't have a good result. But let me just explain what I'm talking about here with the, the need for defining a campaign objective and how you're going to use it. Now, this uh, upper map is a comparative of what we were facing in, in, the, in the with the possibility of World War III in the 1980s in Germany and how we were supposed to deal with this. I was in the Fifth Corps, which was also at Gettysburg in the Civil War. And we, in my division was the 8th ID. You see the, the blue patch with the 8th there. And the other one was 3rd Armored Division. And we were in this sector around Fulda, Germany. And we were going to be assaulted by a major uh, main attack that was by the Soviet Union coming through that down that Autobahn toward Geese in Germany, which would then turn south to Frankfurt. And we were supposed to break that up, but we were also going to be harassed by supporting attacks coming directly at us from the east that are those other arrows there through the Black Moor uh, in over the East German border. And uh, we believed, you know, we were going to use these kill zones. We called them bowls also, which are two of them are there are, are those black circles, Fulda and Hunfeld. And we were going to use that terrain to attrit the Soviet forces and break them up, hopefully in time. And then we were going to fall on that uh, that big attack on its flank and hopefully break it up before it got too far into West Germany. So the idea here is that you're going to use these little objectives to, to, to break up your opponent and administer these massive casualty exercises and events on them. And we believe that because of our superior equipment and training and doctrine and leadership and whatever else we believe that we should be successful, reasonably successful against the massive numbers of the Warsaw Pact. So now that never happened. Thank God it never happened. But uh, that was essentially our plan. And that's the way I look at this Pennsylvania campaign. If Lee had used, look at the bottom map now, if Lee had used, say, Harrisburg as an objective and gotten up there faster than he did instead of spending the 3rd of June through the 21st moving slowly and got his his uh, his his lead corps up there. Now I'm not I'm not advocating you put all of them across the river. You just go there and put a few units across to clear out militia, and use that town for a proper you know for a, a PR event, for example. And the importance of Harrisburg. Why is that an important objective? It's the most southern northern state capital. It's a black eye for the Lincoln administration if you go and occupy it, even just for 24 hours. And what's that probably going to do? It's probably going to force Lincoln to get on the Union commander, in this case, Meade, to get up there and eject him. And there are places up there that have good terrain and high ground where you can set up a nice tactical defense and, uh, and administer another painful repulse. I've got here a place called, this is an example of one of them, high ground in a place called Fairview Park that would fit three core easily and uh, might be a good place uh, to do something like that. And then there are other places around there like that. But this is what I mean where Lee doesn't, you know, what the problem is without having an objective. Too much time was wasted. And no, there were no essential tasks then, therefore, for his subordinates. But, you know, you want to have an objective because all the efforts then 
go toward achieving that campaign objective. And I think if he had done that, if they say he had declared Harrisburg an objective while they were in Virginia, they would have gotten up there much quicker and achieved that purpose. But in this case, you have, I think, what Mulkey says here, you know, an order that can be misunderstood will be misunderstood. And I think, you know, he, his order is really just vague guidance. And he himself, Lee himself loses sight of his own guidance, and he lets himself get sucked into this battle where he has no advantages at Gettysburg, and, and, and unfortunately, he loses. So uh, now I will, uh, one of the other things I, I, I touch on uh, about Gettysburg when I go over the second day, and I'll go over this for you here, is that um, uh, the problem of uh, what Lee wants to do based on, you know, imprecise intelligence, his own intelligence, and something that Meade had come up, I mean, not Meade, uh, General Hood had had seen, and I think was the right thing to do. So what happens, you know, after the first day, the uh, the elements Ewell's Corps and elements of A.P. Hill's Corps push the Union elements of two corps down through Gettysburg, and they take up positions on the high ground in Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, and then uh, uh, General Hancock on the Union side is directed to go there as fast as he can by General Meade to size up the situation. He hurries up and gets there, and he uh, sees he surveys the terrain and he 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 sees how they the union have taken up position on these two hills and then he looks at cemetery ridge and and sees these other uh solid pieces of ground of the round tops and he goes oh naturally this is a great position so he starts setting up a defense there and then when Meade shows up later that night at 11 o'clock he concurs with Hancock. Said, "This is great. This is perfect. This is what we're. This is where we're going to fight if 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 Lee attacks us." So he starts filling in the units as they start coming in during the night along Cemetery Ridge. Now, when Lee's up in the morning on July the second, um, he's riding and he's over on the right side right now, and he sees the end of the Union line there, as I have depicted, about halfway down Cemetery Ridge, and he figures that's their left flank. It's open. Then he rides around to the other side to where Dick Ewell is up there on the opposite cemetery hill in Culp's Hill and asks him, is there any opportunity over Hill? Well, Hill Ewell tells him, no, I don't think so. So Lee decides to concur with Ewell. He comes around the other side again and he decides, okay, I'm going to make the main attack on the on, on my right and, and go after the Union left and catch that flank there, I'll attack up the Emmitsburg Road with the two divisions available under Longstreet. Well, you can see on the upper left-hand corner, the two divisions under Longstreet, they got to take some time to get down into the attack positions. So that doesn't happen until, you know, midday or so. Lee doesn't even tell Longstreet about this until late morning. He has no idea what his plan is until late morning. So there's part of the problem as well. Um, and they, the two of them are together for all of the planning. Now, when, when they start moving, one of Lee's, part of Lee's guidance was you were to approach in a manner as not to be seen by the enemy and to try to get as close to them as you can without being detected. Um, and as they're moving forward, McClaws, General McClaws, starts to come over a rise and he sees the Union signalman on the round top and he realizes, well, they're going to see us. So he calls up General Longstreet, and Longstreet goes, yep, you're right. So then they do this countermarch thing, and then he and Lee come up with an alternate plan. So this is what I have depicted here is the alternate plan. McClaws will attack into the peach orchard, and the wheat field hood will attack the round tops on that, uh, with, uh, in the, as those two arrows have the two divisions depicted. But Hood, while this is going on, Hood had sent riders around to recon behind the round tops and into the back of the Union position. And he they found the Union wagon train there and that the way was open and, the, and there was some decent ground to work with. So he goes to Longstreet and says, sir, let's, let's not butt our head into this well-prepared defensive position that they have now and uh, go around them. Because there was no longer a left flank open there halfway down Cemetery Ridge the Union had already filled in their position all the way down to the round tops. The only thing that was wrong about it was Sickles was, you know, came forward in violation of his orders 
like like you have there on the map. But other than that, it was a integral line. And so that's what Hood was trying to point out. Well, Lee, he takes this to Lee and Lee disapproves. And he says, we're going to go with what I want to do, which is this plan here. Now, a lot of uh, historians and a lot of writers have also criticized Hood because I guess he, you know, was goes against the idea that Lee has here in the books is that they, they criticize Hood that, well, if he had if they had gone with this, Meade would have marshaled reserves and, and crushed this uh, this end run around their back into the rear. Well, I'm sure he would have marshaled, you know, reserves, but how what the outcome would have been, we don't know because it never happened. But I can tell you this, that it, it's still a lot better to contend with reserves that are thrown at you on fair open ground than having to fight, you know, uphill, uh, like in the round tops in the devil's den, against uh, soldiers who are hiding behind rocks, huge rocks and perfectly covered. Now there is an example in the future and why I say this is, is one of, is this example here. Take, take this situation in North Africa where British Field Marshal Ritchie is defending the Gazala line. And if you've got a similar deployment of troops, he's got a line that's anchored to the Mediterranean Sea and goes down to a strong point called Bir Hakim which is in a way similar to this situation on the, on the at Gettysburg, on, on a much larger scale, of course. But uh, uh, it's you know the, the dilemma for the Confederate for the for Rommel is the same as it is for Lee. He's either got to find a way to penetrate and rupture this line somehow to get through directly by the direct approach, or he can do what Hood proposed at Gettysburg was to swing around it, and he chooses the latter. He takes his three German tank divisions, known as the Africa Corps, and swings them around into the rear area, covered on their left flank by the Italian Arete Division. And what this does, as we say in the Army, doing something like this, showing up where you're not expected to show up, puts the enemy on the horns of a new tactical dilemma, and they have to react to it. And by reacting, yes, they're going to marshal some of their reserves, but they're also going to have to pull people out of their main line which makes it vulnerable somewhere else. And that's how Rommel finally undid this position. So uh, I, I believe, you know, and I've seen this also work in the training areas, that Hood was probably right uh, or had a better course of action anyway than what happened on the second day. Uh, so that's something I go through uh, in the book. And so, but of course they didn't go with that. And so what happens is as as they try to follow through on the second day, you know, General Hancock, who becomes kind of the fire brigade commander, he equalizes all of these attempted penetrations by the Confederates, and they and they stop them cold on the second day, and and uh, and and essentially, you know, and they win the day. Really, now, I'm not going to talk about Pickett's charge, the infantry part, but I will give you the benefit of my views as a professional artilleryman about why the Confederate fire support plan didn't work at Gettysburg on the third day and, and what might have been a better scheme of fires uh, might have had a better, uh, you know, cause more damage to the Union Army. The, what, what they did was here on the left, and I believe the, par the problem with this is that the preponderance of the Confederate artillery was directly opposite perpendicular to the Union line, the infantry line, and the, and the Union artillery. Most of them were 90 degree angles, 80 degree angles, 70, 75 degree angles. So, you know, as I pointed out earlier, you know, these were direct fire weapons and they didn't have in this time and age, you know, this age uh, forward observers who could call for fire and, and accurately drop it. They didn't have the computational procedures you know, they didn't have fire direction computers like we have and all of that kind of stuff to bring rounds directly on top of something within like a 10 meter amount of accuracy. So what, you know, what we know, what happened here is that most of the artillery went over the infantry and exploded in the rear behind them. Some of it hit the trains. They, they also were trying to go after the Union artillery. They got about 30 pieces of the Union artillery, but the Union artillery commander, Henry Hunt, coordinator on the union side did a pretty good job of only offering some of some counter battery with only a portion of artillery and keeping most of it well back and waiting for the infantry to to uh, the confederate infantry to move then he moved it forward where it became overwhelming and broke up the union infantry attack so that's what happened now what would be a better 
scheme, I think, would be on the right to put the preponderance of the artillery next to the town that would shoot, uh, that would have a zero angle of fire along the infantry line, the Union infantry line, and, and, and or, you know, close to zero angles of fire, minus five, minus 10, five, 10, 20, 30, 40. So you'll, if you shoot short, medium, or long, you'll probably have a good probability of at least hitting something. And the same thing with another grouping over there behind the claws and and Hood's division. So this I have in my appendix, uh, uh, five, you know, my appendix to talk about uh, just artillery, things like that. So anyway, Gettysburg doesn't work out for the Confederates. And uh, uh, this is a quick uh, rundown of why Longstreet, instead of going into Pennsylvania, what he probably envisioned here, if they had hurried up and gone out uh, to try and relieve the Vicksburg situation. At Vicksburg, you know, Grant uh, finally gets across the river to the south of Vicksburg. Now, Vicksburg has defenses all the way around in the back. So Pemberton believes, well, okay, he's down here. He's going to come directly north, and I'm ready for him just like I was previously. But that's not what Grant does. He's also an operational level thinker. Grant starts moving in this strange direction, which is northeast toward Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and, uh, and this confuses the Confederate leadership in the state, keeps them spread out. They never come together like they should have, in my opinion, and go after him, and especially go after him when he just gets across and he's only at 20,000 or at this arrow where I have 35,000, where he has to take a, a tactical pause. Grant has to stop here and wait for Sherman to get up to bring, you know, to get all of his numbers over. That would have probably been between those two points, that probably would have been the best point for Johnston to gather all these numbers and go after him because the numbers that they have there, the 8,000, the 5,000, the 23,000, they add up to 36,000. So that's about one to one parity. Now, does that mean he would win? I don't know, but. You know, it's better than being uh, spread out and disjointed. Now, let's say uh, you do what General Longstreet had been advocating, the Western concentration. That means bringing, using the interior lines of the nation to bring reinforcements from the Eastern theater there in a timely manner. Then that, say it's 20,000, then that brings your numbers up to 56 versus 35. There you have a possibility of a better result. Now, this, of course, didn't happen because they went to Pennsylvania instead, but this gives you an idea of what he was talking about. Now, uh, I'm almost getting close to being done here, so uh, uh, apologize for going a little long with some of the detail, but uh, after this situation, Lee realizes that Longstreet was probably right. We do need to do something about the Western theater, and the only other possibility now that they have with the loss of Mississippi is to shore up Bragg's situation. Now he's been pushed down into northern Georgia at the conclusion of William Rosecrans's Tullahoma campaign. Now, you know, Rosecrans did a pretty good job of clearing Bragg out of Tennessee, uh, but when he concludes after taking Chattanooga, he's made a mistake. And you can see it here in this map. His three corps are way too far apart, way too spread out. So if one of them gets attacked, you know, suddenly, the other two are too far away to assist it. Bragg realizes this. He's already got some reinforcements from Beauregard along the coast, and he's got two divisions, you know, under Longstreet coming from Virginia. So he starts moving toward that center one. He thinks that's the best target to go after. He was probably right. If you can catch that one and overwhelm it and interpose the army between the two other corps, one in Chattanooga and one down there at Alpine under McCook, you know, they're in trouble too. And then you can go after them at their leisure, break them up. So the first contact uh, as Bragg moves after them is the 18th of September at a bridge. It's a small action uh, uh, near uh, Chickamauga, but the main battle is going to happen on the uh, on the 19th. And here's this, let me orient you to this older map. You can see Chattanooga, the town, uh, the, the red, um, uh, squares, uh, rectangles are the Confederate units under Bragg as they're moving toward the center where that core was. 
And uh, the, the dark blue, of course, are the Union. Now, Bragg's plan is he's going to fold. He's going to, his main attack is going to be on the on his right, and they're going to fold the Union so, uh, troops, keep them, uh, you know, while they're on the south of that Missionary Ridge terrain feature and shove them down into that bluish, grayish oval that I have down here in the lower left. That's what we call non-permissive terrain. It's a place called the Morris Cove. Very hilly, very wooded, be very difficult for the for them to, you know, for the leadership to pr to practice command and control. And I think if he were to separate them from their base at Chattanooga, uh, they would have to infiltrate over the state line into Alabama and then head north to the nearest railhead, which is a place called um, uh, Bridgeport, and then also Stevenson, which are off this map, but they are roughly where the word Chickamauga is on, uh, off the map. So that's that's his scheme uh, for the 19th. <laughs> Excuse me. Here it is uh, on, a, on a clearer map. The plan is that he's going to fold the Union left and push them down. But the problem is he's got, you know, he has a lot of command and control problems in, in his army. It's not as, not as uh, fluidly working as it is in, in Lee's army in Virginia. On that point, and there's no there's no wing commander on the left side. And you can see Hood has arrived with three brigades from Virginia, but they're all peers, and these are all units that have never worked together before. Most of them are from the west, a couple from the coast. The more cohesive corps is the one under Polk on the right. He's the only other he's the only other lieutenant general there under Bragg. So Polk's wing is the main effort, but it's a very disjointed day on the 19th. It really devolves to just brigades pushing on each other and getting on each other's sides and, and so on. It's more like a battle in 1861, like uh, Manassas or Wilson's Creek. So a lot of, a lot of problems with, uh, with trying to put this together in concert. It doesn't really work, but the Confederates still managed to push, push the Union further back toward uh, uh, missionary Ridge. But the good thing that happens for the Union is that they're able, Rosecrans is able to get his three disparate parts put back together. So the army is at least back together and the threat of being, having a single corps overwhelmed and wiped out, uh, destroyed, whatever is, has, has gone away. So that's, that's good for his situation, but the Confederates retain the initiative. Now, Longstreet arrives on the evening of September the 19th, about 11 o'clock, uh, and he finds his, makes his way to Bragg and, uh, and has a, an, a conference with him around midnight for about an hour or so. Bragg gives him a map of the area and tells him, you're going to take over control of the left wing, command of the left wing, and I want you to go over there and get everything sorted out. I'm going to run another version of the, the scheme I had on the on you know the 19th, we'll start on the right with an N echelon attack. Uh, an N echelon attack means, say, the most right unit, which is D.H. Hill up there, he's going to start the event. And then when he moves, then uh, then when his most left unit moves, then Walker's going to go and the next one to the left and the next and the next. And so the signal will come down to Longstreet's wing when the most left unit of the right wing is is going forward. Then Longstreet's right starts. So the whole thing is going to be like a big door. And the most left unit of the entire army is the hinge. And they're going to shove them down again toward Lemoore's Cove. That's his plan anyway. Well, you know, the, the order to do this uh, attack, to start the attack at 7 o'clock, uh, you know, never goes to D.H. Hill up there, the most right unit next to Forrest, who's cavalry never gets to him so he doesn't know he has no attack order when bragg gets up in the morning it's quiet nothing's happening he expects these attacks to be going in and he rides over to polk's headquarters and sees him in a finds him in a, in a farmhouse eating breakfast and asks him general why aren't the attacks going in and hood and polk says well i told them to you know so bragg gets quite angry and he sends his staff down to the units to get him cranked up and then they finally get going you know, probably around 10 o'clock in the morning, most accounts say. Uh, but, you know, this gives the Union time. They've already had time to have breakfast and then do position improvement. So they're pretty firm when these attacks start happening. Now, at 7 o'clock in the morning, Longstreet's also standing over here waiting for to hear sound of battle uh, further 
the to the north end. And nothing's going on. He realizes at that moment that General Bragg's plan has miscarried. Something seriously wrong. So he comes up with a different scheme than what what the an echelon was going to be, and that's going to be. And so what happens is then, in, in a nutshell, is he uses he comes up with a column that breaks through the Union line and uh, and ruptures, you know, uh, and collapses the Union right. They all the soldiers start to flee toward the other wing and toward the gaps there uh, to get out of this place. And uh, General Rosecrans flees the battlefield, heads up to Chickamauga, to Chattanooga. It's General Major General Thomas on the Union side, who's the guy who's thinking on his feet and realizes, uh, I got to do something about this. So he sees this terrain feature called Snodgrass Hill, and he sets up a defense there. And he grabs all these fleeing units and starts emplacing them. And comes up with a cogent defense, and he holds there against Longstreet for the rest of the day until until nightfall. So, what I want to explain, though, what is the modern attack is, is the next couple pieces here, and then I'm and I'm done. So, uh, this is the uh, the Brotherton cabin there at the Chickamauga Battlefield Park. the uh, The wood line behind you is where the Union line would, was, the Hundredth Illinois. The pickets, the pickets were out here on the this property too, but. Uh, Longstreet finds out that there is a private Brotherton who is in one of his Georgia regiments that was out in Virginia. He's summoned to him, and he that's this is this is his house. And he, you know, asks Brotherton, "Is there a uh, way? Is there a cow trail or something to get through the woods there to get to the open terrain behind those woods?" And I just want to show you this next picture. This is a uh, this is my friend Dan Long, Long. His name is Patterson, but he's the great great grandson of General Longstreet there on the right. And in 1999, he met with the grandson of Private Brotherton from his dad's corps uh, at Lee and Gordon's Mill. So, uh, but the the meeting of the original Longstreet and the original Brotherton resulted in Brotherton telling Longstreet about this uh, cow trail. Now it's a road. But you can see that, you know, through the woods there, there's open terrain. That's the Dyer property farm. And Longstreet said, that's perfect. I'm going to have my column that I'm thinking about line up on this and go use that as a control measure to push it through. Now, in the uh, obviously in the First World War there on the left, the biggest problem that the whole thing devolved into was that, you know, you had this static line going from the channel English Channel all the way down, I guess, to the Swiss border. And all they would do for four years is come out of their trenches and go into this no man's land into a kill zone and get mowed down. And then they take turns, both sides would take turns doing this until they, you know, lost a generation and a half uh, doing this. It wasn't until the very end of the war that the Germans envisioned uh, some of their thinkers thought about, you know, coming up with some kind of narrow focus breakthrough tactics that would, in the 1930s, uh, under men like Guderian and other thinkers, become what was called, aka the Blitzkrieg tactics, the, the fast-moving offensive armored warfare. Now, this man, you know, Heinz Guderian there on the bottom right, we call him in the army, American army, the, the grandfather of offensive armored warfare. He's the one who stood up the first couple German tank divisions, and he is a proponent of this. You don't you, you know, you you find a narrow spot, you weight it heavily, and you penetrate in line, but you don't become decisively engaged there. You push deep into the rear areas and you go to disrupt them. You take out headquarters, you cut down communications links, supply depots, and so on and so forth. And then all those units there, like I have here in, in Russia, these Russian, you know, divisions up on the line, they lose situational awareness, they get no guidance, and the whole thing collapses. And the Germans worked this pretty well when they were successful, you know, earlier in the war. And other thinkers too were were good at this, Manstein and so on. But um, at the at the lower level, at where the point of the breakthrough is, the Germans have a word for this. This was the Schwerpunkt, the point of the main effort there, the heavy the heavy point. And this is something that Longstreet has no idea what's going to happen in the future, but uh, he certainly comes up with something like this at this place. He uh, gets over to the left wing, His four, he sees those four Western divisions 
Preston Hyman Johnson and Stewart. The first man he goes to see is Major General Stewart, who points out to him there's a vacant space between us and Polk. So Longstreet orders him to slide all the way over. And he's going to form this column uh, with Major General Bushrod Johnson is the, the point of the spear. And he's got three brigades of Fulton, McNair, and Sugg. He tells Hood, slide over those five Virginia divisions behind him. I mean, those five brigades, rather, uh, from Virginia, Sheffield, Roberts, and Benning, Humphreys, Kershaw, and you've got eight brigades and five echelons. This is going to be my column that he puts in. So this is what he does here, and it may, he makes a very narrow front with this. It's about 400, 450 yards wide, the front of Fulton and McNair. When the most left unit of Polk's uh, wing is in, in the attack. The word gets over to the most right unit there on Longstreet's side, and they, Longstreet gives the order to send this thing through. So the doctrine that we have in modern in modern military, we typically teach that we require about a three-to-one attacker-to-defender ratio to be reasonably assured of penetrating an enemy line. I think here Longstreet plans for a four-to-one attack against this he, he assumes there's at least a, div, a standard division opposite this, which would be a three brigade division. So if you have two brigades up and one back, that would be a maximum depth of two brigades. So eight, he has eight in the column against two, that's four to one. Then he gets a bit of luck. Major or uh, yeah, Major General Rosecrans, um, or I think he was Lieutenant General Rosecrans at the time, orders Major General Wood to move over to the uh, other wing. He thinks there's a gap over there. He wants him to fill it, but there's no gap. And now by moving Major General Wood out of the way, he creates a gap right here, right where, right in front of where Longstreet had put this thing. Now Longstreet doesn't know this, but that's what happened. And as that one brigade is moving, there's just one brigade left that's moving out of the way on the Union side. And then this thing goes forward and it just steamrolls and, and at eight to one. And, and they push on through and uh, start moving across the Dyer property. So so the point that I see, I, I see about this that I realize this is a, a modern piece of thinking is that you see this a lot in the Second World War, as I showed you. You know, here's here's an example where Rommel, who is frustrated with one of his division commanders who doesn't seem to get this idea where, you know, he makes this comment. I want you to concentrate strength at one point, force a breakthrough, you know, penetrate like lightning and get in, you know, as I said, get into the rear areas, deep into the rear. Don't become decisively engaged at the shoulders of where the, the point of breakthrough is. That's the different thinking that Longstreet does here at Gettysburg. Same thing that later in the war, some of the allies get this as well. You know, General Patton, who was still in the doghouse uh, when the landings occurred and was not in, com you know, in command yet, was watching this uh, uh, progress unfold, which was going very slowly. And, uh, you know, he writes here, uh, he criticizes it. You know, this wide, broad front thing isn't working. They try to push all along the front, but they have no power anywhere. And so he, once he comes in and takes over, char takes charge of uh, command of Third Army, you know, he tells Pat, uh, Ike Eisenhower that let's do something else. I'll attack in my sector along a very narrow front with overwhelming power, break through the lines, and then get into the rear areas, get out into the open country, and then we'll have the freedom of maneuver to get around these these strong points. And that's you know that's what he does. So uh, here at Chickamauga. Let me just show you how it how it compares to, say, Gettysburg. Here's the Brotherton cabin on the right, the Confederate line of departure, the, the wood line that I showed you from that other vantage point where the Union uh, brigade should be. And it's only 175 paces from that wood line. And compare that to what they had to do at Gettysburg. All, look at this, all, all this open space, one mile long to get to the Union, one line distant, one mile distant to get to the Union line. And he's got, they've got the troops spread out shoulder to shoulder, brigade, you know, flank to brigade flank without any depth uh, spread out over a mile. And then they're supposed to converge somewhere. Very difficult for command and control. And it just, it doesn't work. You know, they're, everything is, is, everyone is exposed to cannon fire. And then of course, rifle fire. But this here 
very narrow front, 450 yards, these two lead brigades, Fulton and McNair. Here's a uh, plaque painting there at the Brotherton cabin at the Battlefield Park. This is an artist's depiction of what it must have looked like from the Union side as these echelons were coming up, coming at them. There's the first one. You see the second one. The third one's coming out of the woods. And there are two more behind them that they that they don't see yet. So uh, last slide here. This is the, the Schwerpunkt column as it breaks through. Longstreet changes its direction to go in behind the other Union wing to try and get in behind them and bag that group and maybe then use the fast go terrain to get on and cut off the gap and close down the gaps in Missionary Ridge. That was that was his plan there at the morning of. So I'm going to stop there. And of course, there's much more to the book, but uh, I got through two of the main pillars plus some other things, and I'll I'll take some questions at this point.